Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, one of my colleagues, Ben Mor Monreal, is the Agnar Pitta Associate Professor of Physics at Case Western Reserve University. His lab works on novel experimental techniques for hard problems in nuclear, particle, and astrophysics, with much of the work focused on neutrinos and dark matter. But tonight, he's going to tell us about giant telescopes for finding and characterizing planets. Ben. Thanks for having me. I've, I've been here before. I came here maybe two years ago and talked about neutrinos. Some, some of you may remember me. So this is the other side of my, my uh, interest. This is something I was never trained on in any way. And in fact, I had, uh, when I was a graduate student, there were astronomers who told me as a particle physicist I should never work on this, but I'd do it anyway. Um, so what I want to talk to you t about today is uh, how giant telescopes uh, search for exo-Earths. And so one thing I'm not is a planetary scientist. So I'm actually not going to talk too much about the science of these planets and where they come from and why they're there. Um, what I want to talk to you about is the thing I'm excited about, which is the instrumentation that we're going to use to, to learn something about them. Um, uh, if, if we can do something that lets us build big instruments, um, then you know, there are plenty of people who understand the planets who will flock to those instruments and, and, and use them and learn things. So let's start with, it, it turns out this is a very timely uh, talk because this was scheduled a while ago and then uh, just this fall the Nobel Prize announcements came out. So the 2019 Physics Nobel Prize, half of it went to a cosmologist, Jim Peebles, and half of it went to Mayor and Kalos, who are two Swiss astronomers who um, were credited with discovering the first, the first thing that you or I would look at and say, wow, that's a, that's a planet around another star. Um, the thing they discovered was called 51 Pegasi b. Um, and I said, this is an instrumental talk. So I'm not going to talk about the properties of that planet or what we learn about planets from it. Um, but I'm going to talk about the things they used to find it, which is, which is neat. They did that um, by pointing a small telescope, this thing, a 193 centimeter telescope um, in France uh, at this star um, uh, 51 Pegasi. So what, what, that, what I mean when I say it's a 193 centimeter telescope, that means that the, the mirror of the telescope is 193 centimeters in diameter. So there's a circular mirror that collects light when you, when you point it at the sky. Um, because it's so big, it's, it sounds like a big mirror, right? That's a really big um, you know, two meter circle. There's a lot of light it collects, like a big searchlight. And, um, but that's actually a pretty small mirror by modern standards. Anyway, you take this big mirror, you point it at the sky, which requires you to have another 10 meters of support structures and domes and, and, and pointing apparatus. Um, and then you, can, you point it at 51 Pegasi and, and you observe for a while. But since this is such a small telescope, I'm going to show a bunch of things to the, try to show them to the same scale to give you a sense of how big this particular one is. Um, so that's, that's the scale of, of a, the 10 meter high dome of the Hall Provence 193 centimeter telescope. So they pointed that thing at 51 Pegasi b. And what did they see um, back in, in 1995? Um, so you know that when you're listening to, you're standing on the sidewalk and you listen to an ambulance going by, you can tell if the ambulance is coming towards you or away from you by the pitch of the, the sound it makes. If it's coming towards you, it's got a higher pitch. If it's going away from you, it's got a lower pitch. You can do the same thing when you point the telescope at a star. The star has lots of little spectral lines, which are like, all those little lines are like the pitches of, the, of the, um, the vibrations of the atoms in the star's atmosphere. And so these, these astronomers measured a bunch of spectral lines of 51 Pegasi. And um, what you see in these, there's four different plots showing, each of them showing a month or two of repeated observations of the star. And the surprising thing was that sometimes they would see the star, it looked like it was moving away from them. And sometimes they would, they would come back and they would see the star moving towards them and go back and forth and back and forth. And every time they came back and revisited it, it was doing that same pattern. That's the pattern that a star makes if there's a planet going around it. The planet's pulling on the star, the star is pulling on the planet, and they both have to go back and forth. The planet makes a big orbit, the star makes a little orbit, and they were able to see the speeds of that orbit. So 51 Pegasi, they actually never saw the planets. So that's one of the weird things about exoplanet science. We know the planet's there from its gravity, but nobody ever saw it. Not, I, I don't think it's been seen yet in, in any sort of light. 
Um, but yeah, so that, that's the first exoplanet discovery. So that's your Nobel Prize um, in, uh, right there. Here's another example of an exoplanet that we didn't quite see, but we know it's there. So this is an even smaller telescope. Um, the, I couldn't shrink it to scale because it would be one pixel on the screen. You wouldn't be able to see it. This is the Corot telescope, um, a little tiny space telescope. It's 10 inches in diameter in, in the main aperture, so the size of a, you know, a small dinner plate. Um, so they took this little tiny space telescope and they pointed at this star, Corot 28, um, <coughs> and they just sat there. They sat there watching this star at a really high cadence. They measured and measured and measured and measured. Um, Every, uh, every five minutes or so, they would take a new measurement to this star, and they just sat there for, for a month. Um, that's one of the reasons you use a 10-inch space telescope for this. You can't borrow a month of time on the Hubble Space Telescope and, and say, I'm gonna, I just want to watch this one star over and over. It doesn't work. But Corot, you can do it. So they pointed this telescope at the star. They took this trace. So what you're looking at is brightness versus time. Um, the star is usually a certain amount of bright, and then sometimes, some days, it's a little brighter, a little dimmer. Due to, sunspots and vibrations and changes in the telescope. But there's one repeating pattern, which is that every five days, the star goes blip and it gets a little dimmer. There's a little sudden dimming of the star. Um, you can just see them on this plot. If you look at where the green line goes down, you know, kind of about 10 or 15 times over the course of this, this time series, if you took all those little dips and stacked them up, what you're seeing is an eclipse. The star is sitting there, and it gets dim because a little planet passes in front of it and blocks, I mean, only 1.5% of the light. So the star gets a tiny bit dimmer. Um, so you actually need a really sensitive telescope to see a 1.5% change in the brightness of the star. If you tried to do this in your backyard with a regular telescope looking through clouds and atmosphere, the brightness would be all over the place. So this is something that a, a tiny space telescope was really good at. Um, so this was, this was um, uh, actually a kind of late discovery. This is probably 2009, 2010. Um, but basically after uh, Mayor and Kilos found um, 51 Pegasi B, there was an enormous pace of discoveries. Everybody with a small telescope started pointing it at all kinds of stars, doing these radial velocity measurements, doing these Doppler shifts, uh, monitoring stars for a long time and looking for occultations, looking for these special eclipses. And so the number of planets that we knew about just skyrocketed. So notice that's a log scale. So from knowing about a planet or two in 1990. And if you looked at those things, you wouldn't look at that and say, oh, that was a planet. You'd say, this is some kind of weird double star system. Um, so from Meyer and Kalos from, from, from 95 through about 2009, um, we found a few hundred of them. There was lots of ground-based effort that made that happen mostly. And then in 2009, a thing called the Kepler Space Telescope launched. Kepler was a space telescope devoted exclusively to looking for these little blinks on and off in the brightness of stars. And um, it ran for, for nine years uh, in different phases, pointed at these enormous patches of sky, monitored thousands and thousands of stars simultaneously, and just filled our catalogs with exoplanets. It was really exciting times. Um, and what we learned is that planets are common. That's the thing that was so surprising about this. You don't have to go sifting through the whole Milky Way, hoping to find a rare planet here and a rare planet there. There are planets everywhere. Every, uh, uh, I think pe people think that it's, it's uh, maybe not a majority of stars, but nearly a majority of stars have some kind of planetary system around them. Not that they're all visible, but they're probably all there. OK, so we've looked at planet, We've looked at stars. We've inferred the existence of planets, but we haven't seen the planet yet. Sh you're like, show me a picture of the planet. I want to see dinosaurs crawling around on the surface of the planet. OK, let, let's try it. So you can do this at home. You can go to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has all of its, it's a beautiful sky survey taken with a 2.5 meter telescope. And all of their data is online in a nice catalog you can zoom into. So I picked a, a special star, which I happen to know has interesting planets, HR8799. Um, and here's a nice view of it in the middle of your screen. Everything you see on there is a star. We're going to have to zoom in a lot. That's HR 8799, as seen by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Let's zoom in and see if we can see the planet going around it. I'm going to zoom in really far. Closer. 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 This is going to be easy. Closer. Anybody see the planets? No? What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong is the stupid star is in the middle of your image, and all the light of the star is blurred out over your detector. And the whole detector is so saturated with starlight, you would never see the actual light reflected off a tiny planet going around this thing. Um, in fact, 
if the solar system, if our solar system were out and then we were looking at it from here, this is, what, this is where things would be. The sun would be in the middle. The Earth would be you know, a couple of pixels away from it. Ju even Jupiter and Uranus, really big planets. We think of them as faraway planets. On the scale of trying to see a planet around a faraway star, the solar system is tiny. Everything is really close together. So again, this is all online data. You can, you can, go, uh, you can go dig this up yourself. Um, so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey with a 2.5 meter telescope, bigger than Hall Provence, uh, cannot resolve a little image of a star. But that would, game's not over because we have bigger telescopes. Let me go to, I said this is an instrument talk. I want to show you the coolest telescopes in the world. Um, the Keck Observatory is a 10 meter uh, segmented mirror telescope. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, it's, in, um, <clears throat> it's on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And uh, Keck has some really incredible instrumentation, some of the best cameras in the world um, on one of the, the, the finest instruments in the world under some of the quietest skies in the world. Mauna Kea is a lovely place to do observing. And this is what they saw in a series of observations of HR 8799. So because the telescope is so big and so focused, instead of the starlight being smeared out over the whole detector, the starlight all is, is focused. It's all squeezed into the middle. In fact, it's squeezed into the middle, and the, um, the people who made this image have tried to subtract it out. So the starlight is gone as best they can do. And this is what they see after subtracting the starlight. Okay, the remaining 90 minutes of this, of this session will be consist of just watching this. <laughs> so yeah. so as, as you can see, there are four big things orbiting um, pretty far away from HR8799. I'll put the, um, the Earth scale back on there. So those dots are not Jupiters, they're not Marses, they're not Earths. Those dots are enormous blobs of gas. They're sort of planet sized but they're sort of like giant Jupiters. And they're orbiting way, way far away from the star, which is why we can see them. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we can see so far. That's the sort of thing that we say we have when I say, we've taken an image of a planet. Uh, we've taken images of really weird, bright, hot planets. In fact, these are planets that are emitting their own light. Uh, they're sort of like a big Jupiter that's so hot from its formation that it's glowing a bit. And that's what we see here. Um, but it's still a beautiful system. We saw all four of these things. And you can tell, and this will come up again later in the talk, when I tried to subtract the starlight, it's not perfect. There's lots of little flickers of noisy, um, we call them speckles, surrounding where the, star used to, where the starlight used to be. Um, those speckles are a problem. And in fact, if we wanted to look in this thing and say, I want to see something at Jupiter's orbit, we still wouldn't be able to. Even with 10 meter Keck telescope, that's like a $100 million telescope. It's probably got $30 million worth of cameras on it to, to take this observation. Um, very difficult to, to pull this off. Let's see what we got here. OK, so um, Keck Telescope couldn't do it. I couldn't gil deliver you a picture of a dinosaur crawling around on a, another planet. Um, can anything do it? Well, we're trying. So I'm just going to scroll. This is an image that the European Space Agency generated just showing all the current biggest telescopes in the world and the big next generation. So we're going to roll by. There's the VLT. That's four giant telescopes in Chile. They're each 10 meters, each in their own dome. Um, they will soon be joined by the ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is three times the diameter, nine times the area. There's the two Kecks from Mauna Kea, which will soon be joined, we hope, by the 30 meter telescope. Again, sort of nine times the area, three times the diameter. GTC is on, in, on La Palma. Um, uh, Subaru is in South America. SALT is in South Africa. NTT is little, but it's interesting. Um, giant Magellan Telescope is the other giant South American project. Um, so 10 meter telescopes weren't big enough. 30 meter telescopes are almost big enough. And we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, we'll come back to those 30 meter telescopes towards the end of the talk. The next thing I want to talk about is, oh, it went away. Um, we're going to talk about the basic physics of that image, where all those little dots come from, why they are the size they are. And, um, and why we couldn't subtract the star entirely. When you talk about a space telegraph, are you talking about something that's been sent into orbit? Yes, space telescopes are telescopes that are somehow orbiting. Some of them are orbiting the Earth, and some of them are flying around the solar system in other ways. Um, but yes, yeah, space-based versus ground-based is the basic dichotomy in, in astronomy. 
How fast do these planets orbit around their sun? So HR8799, um, well, you know, let's, let's do an experiment. We can just measure it by looking at this image. Uh, so they're going around and you see it go through, they go through like 5% of their orbit. The, the innermost one maybe goes through 5 or 10% of its orbit in four or five years. So these are on sort of, I can multiply, 50 year, 100 year orbits. So they're very far out things. Um, I don't know what the mass of the star is either. Maybe it's a more massive star. On HR 8799, those are giant planets that are pretty far away. That's right. Smaller planets obviously would be much closer, would be much harder to detect like this. Now, my understanding uh, of detecting uh, planets um, by either the Doppler technique or the dimming requires the plane of the orbit to be along our line of sight. It would have to pass in front of the sun, yep. in front of the star, and, and for both those techniques, right? Does that plane of orbit, how close does it have to be to our line of sight for those two techniques to work? If you want to see a star with a planet passing right in front of it, it has to be lined up just perfectly. There's no margin for error. Yeah, it's just, it's just the size of the star that lets you, lets you see it. From that, you could calculate how many planetary systems we cannot detect. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Kepler looked at t many thousands more stars than it saw planets around, because most of them are just misaligned in some way. So, so we can assume that 99% of us uh, of, syst of uh, planetary systems are not detectable. Not by the occultation. The Doppler shift version, you see a weaker Doppler shift if it's not lined up, and you see a stronger Doppler shift if it's lined up. So it doesn't rule it out the same way the occultations don't. And so people have done that statistics very carefully uh, to try to figure it out. Have you estimated or calculated how far away in light years are these, is this particular one? A lot of the planets we know about, when you're doing the occultations or the, um, or the Doppler shift technique, it doesn't depend on the star being really close. Because you're just, you're just, if it's a star you can see, it's a star you can measure. So the thousands of exoplanets discovered by Kepler are mostly sort of eight kiloparsecs away. So it's like you know, uh, thousands of light years away. Um, the stars that we're going to focus on to try to see planets orbiting we're going to pick like the 100 closest stars to the solar system. We're going to look at those first. So it's, um, yeah, and so in distance, that's 10 or 20 or 30 light years. That's as close as we get. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Ben Monreal discussing how astronomers have found planets around other stars by observing the wobble in the star caused by the orbiting planet. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Professor Monreal will discuss how the telescopes work that look for the very faint signal of a planet around another star. Now, back to the talk. So now we're leave telescopes aside, leave uh, dinosaurs aside. Uh, let's go to, back to Optics 101. This is a basic physics lesson. What does it mean for a telescope to collect light from a star and, and show it to you? What is actually happening inside the telescope that makes that happen? So imagine that there's a star far off, let's see, to L, so far off to your left, emitting light towards us. Uh, what does that light consist of? Light is sort of, light is a wave. Um, it's sort of like a radio wave or a wave in water in that there's peaks and troughs in, in, the, in the case of light. Those are the places where the electric field is high or low or positive or negative. There's electric and magnetic fields in light. Um, but if you want to picture it as a water wave, that, that works just fine for this talk. Picture yourself at the beach. It's a nice calm day. You Maybe picture yourself in Wade Lagoon and you've thrown a rock into it and you watch the little ripples propagate out. For a source that's very, very far away from you, those ripples arrive as straight lines. There, there are crests of the wave. They're all just perfect parallel sheets. And those sheets propagate through space in the direction perpendicular to them. So if you could measure, if you wanted to know where some light was coming from, if you could measure the orientation, and here is vertical orientation, if you could measure how the wave front was oriented, to draw a line dead perpendicular to that, and you'll find the source. So what a telescope does is something kind of clever. Um, a telescope is, it starts with a lens, and I've drawn a lens in the middle of this image, just schematically anyway, that big oval, is doing something to the light. And what it is doing is delaying some parts of the wave crests. They're all trying to move, but in some parts of the lens, I'm going to make them move slowly. 
And some parts of the lens are going to make them move quicker. I'm going to let them go as fast as they can. And I can rearrange the wave fronts. I can slow them down in the middle. So instead of all those wave fronts being uh, flat and parallel to each other, arriving at the same time, I can make them into semicircles. So a semicircular wave front won't travel in the direction it came from. It'll converge to the, to the radius of curvature. Um, it's really hard to demonstrate this in water, but you can demonstrate it in reverse. If you drop a pebble into a pond, you know that you get circular ripples of, of water. So take a movie of that and just play it backwards. Circular ripples will converge on a single point and put all their energy into that point and there'll be a little splash where the rock, you know, where the rock would have been. So that happening forwards is what's happening here. By using the optics to sculpt flat waves into circular waves, I can make them all the light energy show up in one point. That one point on the right side of the, the plot is where you're going to put your camera. You put a sheet of film, you put a CCD, um, whatever sort of instrument you use to detect light, and you will detect light right at the center. So the center of your detector corresponds to light that came in in a straight line. So here's the interesting thing about it, and this is why I, I spend all this time doing, doing the, the basic physics version of things. It doesn't come to an exact perfect point. It comes to a little blurry point. The light always converges, but it doesn't converge to a, a even if the, the, the planes were exactly parallel, the light only converges to about as well as you could tell they were parallel by comparing the different parts of the wave to each other. Let me show you what happens if, if you had not one source but two sources. Supposing there were two stars in the sky, uh, one coming from straight across, one coming from slightly above. Out in front of the lens, that light's interfering with each other. It'd look really complicated. It'd be really hard to sit there in that set of waves and, and figure out where the waves were coming from. Because they're not really coming parallel in this nice organized way. But after you run it through the lens, the lens actually sculpts those incoming waves using the same sort of delays all overlapping on the both sets of waves coming in. And miraculously, it separates it into two, does it separate into two spots? I was going to say it separates it into two spots, but it doesn't. The light doesn't focus perfectly. So here, we, I know I put in two sources. Oh, I know I put in two sources in two different positions, but on your camera, you're still just seeing one spot of light. The two sources are still blurred together. I'll have to move the source higher up. Source is higher up. Those waves are propagating. They're interfering on that side in a weird way, but then they've formed into two overlapping semicircles on the side, and they're converging to two spots. And so now your detector sees two spots of light. That's what you want to be able to do to detect exoplanets. That's what you want the telescope to do. You want to see one dot for each star, and you want there to be a little space between them to, to, so you can tell them apart. If you move the light further apart, you, you get better separated dots. Um, so this is what telescopes have been doing for as long as there have been telescopes. If you go back to Galileo, Galileo was able to build like by hand using I don't even know what techniques. He was able to grind a little lens out of, out of glass what kind of terrible glass they had at the time, I don't know. Um, you put it in a meter long tube, pointed at a star with his eye, uh, eye at one end and a lens at the other end, and, and see, and he aimed it at Jupiter. And for the first time, he was the first person in the world to look at Jupiter and see this, which he put in his notebook, which there is a, Jupiter has a, a dot in the middle. And then he saw four little specks of light, two on each, well, for this observation, two on each side. He revisited this observation over and over again, and the dots were in different places on different observations. So that's him seeing, he saw Jupiter, and he saw that Jupiter has four big moons, and he was able to see the light from those moons as separate little spots. The detector was his own retina. He was just looking at this by eye. Retina's a, retina's a great detector, actually. Um, the lens was this little thing he'd hand polished out of a piece of glass. There are ways of doing that, even at pretty low tech. Um, and he was, able to, he was able to see this, which is remarkably similar to what we're trying to do today with, with our exoplanets. Let me step forward. So um, Galileo could do that, but we have to do something harder. We're going to look at a star with a planet next to it, and the star is going to be bright, and the planet's going to be dim. So now the effect where the starlight is concentrated in the middle but blurred out a little bit is a problem. Because the planet light is coming in in a different direction. The planet light is focusing to its own little spot, but the second spot is so dim. I don't know, so I never, didn't know how this projector was going to work. You can see on that top image that there's a star and a planet. That planet is 20% as bright as the star. 
for this illustration. When we do this on the sky, we're going to try to discover exoplanets. We're going to be looking for things that are one millionth as bright as the star. If we wanted to see Earth, do you know how bright Earth is compared to the sun? If you were in a t sitting far away from the Earth and looking at our little blue dot, and then you looked at the sun, it's a factor of 10 to the 11. It's 10 parts per, it's like 50 parts per trillion brightness ratio. It's terrible. The Earth is really dim. Um, I feel sorry for all the alien astronomers who are looking at us trying to figure out what we're doing, because they don't, they're not going to be able to figure it out. Um, so one thing you can do is make your telescope bigger. So here's what happens when you make a bigger telescope. So it's going back. What determines the size of that spot? What determines how blurry it is? The thing that determines how blurry that spot is is the, the general principle we had to begin with. You would put a spot in the middle of your detector if you knew that the wave fronts were coming in perpendicular to your lens. And what is that? You think about what that means exactly. If I want to say that this wave, so the wave you can see, is coming in perpendicular to the lens, what I mean is that the crest of the wave arrives at the top of the lens at the same time it arrives in the middle and the same time it arrives at the bottom. If I can go back a little bit. Uh, a light ray coming from a different direction, like that, that second star, that light ray is arriving at the crests are arriving at the top first, and arriving at the bottom later. But it doesn't really work unless you're doing it by a full wavelength. So the wavelength scale divided by the diameter of the lens is what tells you how well you can tell how parallel those wave fronts are to you. So let's make the lens bigger. So in this picture, it's going to look like the light got smaller. But what actually I meant to do is make the lens bigger. So this is what it looks like when a, the same star, the same planet are being illuminated, uh, are, are shining onto an enormous optical system. This is like two or three times the size of the, of the one we had before. And that's what happens to the, the light. The light propagates the same as it did before. Those parallel wave crests come in, but you're catching more of them. And when you converge them into circular waves, you're converging them into these huge circular waves that converge in nice little tiny, tiny spots. And so now your star and your planet are well separated. So that's what we need to do. That's step one of discovering exoplanets, is make the telescopes bigger. There is no too big that we, wouldn't, you know, that we don't want to work. Um, as far as I know, there's no such thing as too big when you're looking, at, when you're looking for exoplanets. One of my colleagues at, in Santa Barbara used to talk about, he, wanted to, he always referred to the ultimate telescope as DinoCam. Um, if you, really, if you wanted to see objects on the surface of a distant planet, you would need a telescope uh, 100 kilometers across. Um, we, we don't have that. We're not talking about that today. But, we, but we might, we'd like to see that little dot. So step one is make the telescope bigger, just so the dots are smaller. Step two is we made the mistake of doing this from Earth. Um, we have an atmosphere. Every star you look at, and this is, you can do this even by eye. You go out and look at the stars, and they're flickering, right? What is the flickering? The flickering is the fact that you're actually behind a big lens already. You're behind the atmosphere. The atmosphere is patches of cold air and patches of hot air, different densities, different indices of refraction. The light's traveling through all that, and it's all blowing past you at, at you know, 100 miles an hour in the stratosphere. It's all these fast winds carrying little bits of random lenses past you. So in fact, when you're standing on the Earth's surface, the wave fronts don't look parallel like they look in the textbook. They look like this. If you watch this long enough, you'll see that's not just distorted wave fronts, but distorted wave fronts that are different over time. They're shifting. Sometimes the light looks like it's coming from above. Sometimes on parts of the lens, the light looks like it's coming from below. So what does a lens do to light that looks like that? I, I, was gonna, I was thinking about trying to write the code that would simulate this, and I would show you the little blue image. But instead, I downloaded some, a picture from an actual telescope. This is what light coming through the atmosphere, focused as best a two-meter telescope can do. This is Kitt Peak. Looks. Does it look like a spot? No. Does it look like a, can you even tell, is that a single star or a binary star we're looking at? Is there an exoplanet around it? You can't tell. All you're seeing is the misfocusing caused by the atmosphere you know, blowing past you. This um, 
If you had a really tiny telescope, when you do this with your eye or when Galileo does it, the atmosphere's effect is just to move. There's a tiny spot you get, and it moves around, and that's OK. As soon as your telescope's about bigger than about 20 centimeters, the spot starts splitting up. And in a, a two meter telescope, it splits up into lots of little bits that are all interfered with each other. It's awful. Um, but so we're stuck here on Earth. We're pointing our telescopes through this awful atmosphere. And uh, we can fix it. This is the amazing thing about it. This is some of the coolest instrumentation anywhere in optics. Um, uh, and some of the technology that gets used here is starting to propagate into other fields of physics. So here's, here's the thing we do, and this actually works, believe it or not. Uh, we shoot from the telescope, we shoot a laser into the atmosphere. The laser measures what the atmosphere is doing. Some of the laser light bounces back into the telescope. So now our telescope, instead of just kind of collecting all the light it sees and sending it onto a detector, we're going to collect all the light and send it into an extraordinarily complex optical table that's going to separate out the laser light and everything else. The laser light gets used to measure what the atmosphere is doing. And then, so here's the, here's the key, key thing. Remember what a lens does. A perfect lens has the job of sculpting incoming plane waves and turning them into spheres. That's, that's what a lens does. But if you knew that the light that was coming in was not a plane wave, you'd say, well, I just need a different lens. For any random distortion of the incoming light that you can invent, somebody could invent a mirror that would focus that light. It would take the weird light coming in after the atmosphere, figure out what the mirror should be shaped like, and say, I want a mirror that looks like that. Except the atmosphere is changing, so you need to do that again every, every tenth of a second or every 30th of a second, ideally every, every 300th of a second for the, for the future instruments. Um, so those, the technology that makes that possible is called a deformable mirror. The mirrors and telescopes, you think of them being these big, rigid pieces of glass. That's true for the big one, the one that collects the light. But somewhere deep in the optical system, in modern telescopes, there's a little flat, flexible mirror with lots of little actuators behind it. And the mirror is always bending and flexing to make sure it's always exactly the right mirror for what the atmosphere is doing now. So this is called adaptive optics. Um, I have two short videos showing illustrations of adaptive optics in action. Um, this one is from, from AMNH. Uh, uh, so light from a telescope is being, is, uh, here's a, um, on the side, there's a little yellow illustration. From the telescope, you're getting distorted light coming through the atmosphere. The first mirror you bounce it off of is going to be this distorted one, and so the wavefront will be corrected. So the three orange images up there, I'll start them animating. On the left, you see an image of what the instrument thinks the atmosphere is doing. That is the measurement of the laser light telling you where light is delayed. Oh, I want to just play that again. Where light is delayed and where, it is, um, where it's arriving late and where it's arriving early. So that's the measurement of the atmosphere. In the middle is a calculation of what mirror you would need to bounce that light off of to flatten it. And then on the right is what the light looks like after it's been flattened. So that's the, what you're seeing is the deviation from a plane wave. So we've taken this random atmospheric lens and we've corrected it. Um, it's kind of amazing that this works. So from that, the telescope I was just showing you, on the, there's a, the star blurred out by the atmosphere. If you just sat there and, and let it sit on your detector for a long time, it would just look like a big blob. If you take the same telescope, turn on the adaptive optic system, you can get a picture of a single star down to the diffraction limit, behaving as if the atmosphere weren't there. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. And I, I found this, this image happened. This is from the, sort of the, the paper uh, testing out this new robo-AO system. Um, uh, whose main point is this is an AO system whose laser communicates with the FAA to make sure it's not shooting at airplanes as it goes by, which is kind of neat. Um, so they pointed it at a single star, and they can see it. They pointed it at a double star, and they could see the separation of the two stars. But even better than that, here's an image. And this is a, this is a, a very, uh, um, there's a lot of science in this image, which I'm not going to talk about. This is when the VLT, the Very Large Telescope in Chile, uh, one, of, one of the VLTs, um, pointed at the galactic center, and they kept pointing at the same field near the middle of our galaxy. They did that for 20 years, and about half of their observations are from before they had adaptive optics, and about half are from after they had adaptive optics. So I'm going to show you a little video of stars moving around in the middle of our galaxy, and you'll be able to see the AO turn on. 
Okay, there's blurry stuff. Oh, and suddenly it sharpens. There's blurry stars, and suddenly it sharpens. There's blurry stars, and suddenly they sharpen. Blurry stars, and suddenly they sharpen. They don't just sharpen, but you can also see there's a bunch of dim stars that were blurred out before, and now you can see them. You can also see that the AO is not perfect. It subtracts, it gets most of the starlight concentrated into a nice little sharp spot in the middle, but there's always this speckle around it. There's always this error in the correction. The atmosphere is always there. And that error is, is what's going to make it hard to find exoplanets from the ground. Um, if you look up, you'll, you'll see the flickering around those bright stars that are coming in. So that's, that's some of the best adaptive optics in the world uh, prior to today. It gets better all the time. People work very hard in it. So if I throw a rock in a pond, it has ripples. And if I throw another one in the pond, it also has ripples that would distort the original ripples. So how does a telescope discern the first ripple and take out the other ones? It seems like there's so much light all over the place, light bouncing off light would distort it. That's one of the amazing things about light is it does, light doesn't bounce off of light. Two light beams will pass right through each other having no effect up to an incredibly good degree of precision. Uh, it's a linear system, and if, it's, if, the, if the ripples are not adding up perfectly, they can cancel out perfectly beyond what you could imagine was possible. Their light is incredibly good at not interfering with other light. Going back to your first segment, um, I'm curious about the economics of that 10-inch ROCO uh, telescope. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the economics of it? That was not a NASA mission. I actually have no idea what the, what the cost of a little telescope like that was. Um, it's, it's about the size of what NASA would call a mid-X mission. Um, which is a, a mission which would typically take like a $200 million launch vehicle and put a $40 million satellite on top of it. That's kind of the low end of anything you can do in space that's not, that, that wouldn't fit in your pocket. It, it, it starts at, at a few hundred million dollars for those little telescopes. When we're talking about Kepler, um, the big telescopes start at, you know, they kind of start at $500 million or a billion dollars. That's at, at the low end. I'll show you the high end in a couple of minutes. I was uh, reading about Elon Musk's uh, satellite-based internet uh, system that he's trying to put in place. Right now he's got 200 uh, low Earth orbit satellites in place, but his ultimate goal is to have up to 40,000. Um, is that going to cause any issues for ground-based telescopes uh, in observation, or do you have a way to account for that? Astronomers are, are very mad about this Starlink proposal, um, especially the fact that there doesn't seem to be any sort of um, authority to appeal to to make it stop. You know, it's not like it's not like the EPA tells us tells you not to pollute space. Um, yes, astronomers do have to worry about satellites flying across the field of view of their telescope uh, when they're pointing. <coughs> um, and the more satellites there are, the harder it is to do that. And the more if your observation time is wasted on frames you can't use or on strips you have to subtract. Uh, for Starlink, uh, there were some early calculations suggesting that ground-based astronomy was just dead. Like every exposure you ever took forever was going to be saturated with little, with little streaks. Um, then Musk released some more details about what the satellites looked like and how bright they were and what their orbits were, and it looked a little better. But then there's 40,000 of them, and then it started looking worse again. And one of the things that we, that we again, just the lack of a regulatory authority that tells us, well, that it, even, even if the first one's OK, Who's going to stop the next one from being worse? Who's going to lose control of them and forget to paint them black and, and make them ruin all of our astronomy? So it certainly has the potential to be very bad uh, if something isn't done to keep ground-based astronomy in mind. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Ben Monreal. Professor Monreal is Agnar Pitta Professor of Physics at Case Western Reserve University and a fellow of the Institute for the Science of Origins. In the second part of our talk, we discussed the wave optics of how telescopes work. In our final segment, Professor Monreal will discuss the next generation of telescopes that are being developed in part to see planets around other stars. Now, back to our talk. Rest of the talk, I want to give you sort of a slideshow of um, what some of the instruments look like that are going to do the next stuff and maybe sh uh, show you what to expect the best telescopes and the best instruments of the next 10 or 20 years to, to, to do. Um, 
It's not DinoCam, but it'll be, it'll be something. Uh, so here's a, a, a slideshow of the big three 30-meter telescope projects. This is the giant Magellan telescope. So when you're, think, when you're picturing a giant telescope, when you read about them, uh, what you're picturing is somebody grinds the biggest lens they can, or the biggest mirror that they can afford, and then you know, 10 years later, somebody else fi figures out how to make a bigger mirror. Well, that, that process is kind of over. People figured out how to make eight meter mirrors, and they stopped. It is not easy to go bigger than that. It's not easy to transport mirrors bigger than that. Um, so GMT took the approach to build a bigger telescope. I'm going to take seven of the biggest mirrors I know how to build. I'm going to patch them together into a big little sort of flower, um, all on a single mount. And that whole big flower aims at the sky. It's inside of a big dome. And so that's a 30 meter diameter flower of, of seven, eight meter mirrors um, inside of this thing the size of a small office building that has to be able to move around to aim it. Um, here's the big European effort, the ELT. Um, again, this is a South American project. So ELT did the same approach that the Keck telescope did. I'll show you, you'll see a little more of this hardware in a minute. Um, that mirror looks very smooth in this picture, but that's actually built of hundreds and hundreds of little tiny mirrors. Like each one about a meter, 1.5 meter diameter, I think. Um, they're all hexagons, and they all patch together perfectly to make one giant 30 meter mirror um, that lives in a, a somewhat more compact dome. But again, all those mirrors have to behave as one and aim at the sky. 30 me uh, that's actually 39 meters across. This is the biggest of the three. The um, uh, US, Canadian, Japanese, I believe, project called the TMT, the 30 meter telescope. Um, is the most compact of them. They've managed to fit a 30 meter telescope, um, again, built of these small segments. There'll be a picture in a minute, um, into this very clever dome that doesn't have to be so big. Um, and this is the one I know best, just because I used to be in the University of California, which is closely uh, involved in this. Um, and, I'll, and again, I'll show you one of the beautiful instruments that they're planning on putting on TMT, and that I know a bit about the exoplanet reach of. And then, because, you know, this is my talk, so I can talk about whatever I want. I'm going to talk about my own, my own pet project. Um, first of all, just the scale of these things. In this picture, you can see some little cars and trucks parked next to the building yeah. to give you a sense of how big it is. It's huge. Here's, there, you can, there's, another, there's a little truck parked there. They have to use trucks for scale, because if you put a person in there for scale, you wouldn't be able to see them. Um, you can see the front door of the TMT building. It's in the shadows there. These things are enormous. So my telescope, I have a telescope project, which is totally unfunded, if anybody wants to fund me. Um, if you can imagine, uh, here's my per there's a person for scale you can see up here. It's pixelated, because we're going to zoom way out in just a minute. And imagine that person standing next to a bunch of mirrors, each mirror about two meters tall. So a mirror as tall as you. And then let's make a wall of them like a giant and very expensive ballet studio with a curved wall 100 meters long, stretching out along the ground. You could build a mirror like that. You could segment it, line up all those mirrors, polish them all just right. And that would be a very dumb thing. That would be a telescope that's aimed at the horizon. So something right in front of you could have light come in and, and, and focus. You don't want a telescope aimed at the horizon. So this is what my project does. Um, there actually had to add a second mirror in front of it. There's the whole facility. In, in, in sketch form. Um, starlight coming into this facility actually hits a, a primary mirror first, which is just flat. The first mirror's job is just to direct the starlight horizontally towards the giant ballet wall. And the ballet wall is curved to give you a focus. So in designing this, this is one of the projects I work on. I spend about, I was spending about half my time on it. It's a little less these days. Uh, but uh, I was trying to design just like what happens if you take the existing mirror technology? Is there any way to rearrange it in a way that works for, especially for exoplanets, um, without being as expensive and as big and unwieldy as these other things? Um, so that's, we call it weight, um, W-A-E-T. There's a reason for that. You can ask me in the Quest Q&A. Um, and so whereas the other 30 meter telescopes are budgeted at about a billion dollars each, I think I could build this for 150 million. If anybody has the money in that restaurant. Um, so OK, let's go back to TMT. I want to show you the instrument, the, the beautiful, beautiful instrument that TMT will use to do its pr flagship exoplanet searches. So TMT works like this. Here's a cutaway of the dome. Light comes into the dome uh, through, the, through the opening. It bounces off the giant mirror, the expensive mirror. Um, travels up to the top of um, the called the secondary mirror, which is an expensive thing held on an expensive frame. 
Um, that doesn't focus it. That just sort of steers it back towards the ground where you can direct it sideways into a thing called the Naismith platform. The Naismith platform is the most stable part of the telescope. It's something it doesn't have to tilt when the telescope is aiming at different parts of the sky. And on that platform, you can build giant instruments. So here's a giant instrument. Looks like a three-story building with a blue box on it. That's the Naismith platform. There'd be a hole on the other side of that blue box where the light from the telescope comes in. And inside that box, and here's, there's a person for scale, this is what the optics look like. Um, there's on the very top of that, you can see a label that says light from telescope. The light beam comes in, bounces a couple of times, and hits something called DM11. That's the deformable mirror. That is a giant piece of, of very, very thin glass with uh, about 3,600 little actuators behind it, changing its shape uh, probably about a, a hundred times a second making it match the atmosphere over Mauna Kea for perfect um, flattening of all the starlight coming in. Um, I, tried to, I did try to look up for this talk, how much does those deformable mirrors cost? I was able to find the words very expensive in a paper, but I don't know how much they actually cost. Um, for like, for RoboAO, the one I was showing you before, deformable mirrors are like, most people use deformable mirrors that would fit, that are about an inch across. They're really tiny things made of fancy silicon. Um, Making them big enough to fit in TMT is just the cutting, cutting edge of technology. And this still isn't as big as we want. Um, there's actually two of them in there. There's DM11 and there's DM0, which, uh, which does some secondary correction. OK, so here's our science. Here's our, my very, very complicated science slide. We want these telescopes to be able to detect exoplanets. We want images of the exoplanets. We want a little dot with light. That's hard to do. And the reason it's hard is hard on two axes. On the y-axis, OK, so first, all those little dots are places on this plot we expect planets to show up if we survey the 1,000 or so nearest stars. So on the top of the plot, it'd be easy to detect a planet because it'd be a nice bright planet, a planet which is comparable to its star you know, maybe only a few hundred thousand times dimmer than its star. So brighter planets would be easier to detect, but they don't exist. All the planets that, that we think exist live on the too dim end of this plot on the bottom. Of course, it'd be easier to detect a planet if it were far from its parent star, if the light didn't blur together too much. So that's on the, on the right-hand side of the plot. But there's not too many planets out there. Especially if a planet is far from its star, it's going to be a dim planet. You know, Pluto is a dim planet. Mercury is a bright planet. But Pluto's far and Mercury is close. So you can't win in this sense. All you have to do is get down to that bottom corner of the plot where things are too dim and too close. Now, there are three, we divide planets often into three classes. There's things that are sort of Jupiter-y, big gas giants. There's things that are sort of Neptune-ish, so more massive, a rocky core with some gas around it. And then there are things that are rocky. I don't want to call them Earth-like, because a lot of them are probably Venus-like or Mars-like, just dead rocks, um, hot, boiling, Mercury-like things, maybe. Um, so those are all the green dots. So if you've built a telescope that can catch one of those green dots, that's what we want. We want to find one of those planets, get a little picture of it. Um, can the 30-meter telescopes do it? The line I just put up, the top of that GSM, GSMT estimates line, is what the first generation instruments will do, people think. We'll, we'll turn on TMT, we'll turn on that giant expensive camera I just showed you, and we will measure anything that is at least kind of an arc second from the parent star, nice and far, and only a million times dimmer which is nice and bright. So we would see all the easy planets. We would not see any of the hard planets. That's the first $1.4 billion of investment gets you that line. When you build one of these telescopes, you keep the telescope around for a long time, and you keep adding new instruments to it. So there are already plans for the second generation of TMT instruments that we think will get you down here, if you're an optimist. <clears throat> Why don't they exist yet? Why don't we have plants? Because they depend on deformable mirrors that haven't been invented yet. People say, well, by, by 2030, somebody will have figured out how to make a mirror bigger with more pixels in it. If we can do that, so 30 meter telescopes, first generation instruments, m master the DM technology, keep pushing, we get it. They're good enough. We don't get all of them. We don't get everything we point at, but we get a few, a couple lucky planets that happen to be uh, Earth-like planets that do inch over into bright enough and that inch out into far enough away. We can do it from the ground in 2040. 
Not 2020, not 2025, not 2030. I think it's going to be 2035, 2040 before we get them. It's different from space. Uh, space telescopes, it's much easier to push down to dim, dim, dim stuff. Not the dimmest. The dimmest is, we think, impossible, but pretty dim. It's harder to push over to the, uh, the close stuff, because you can't make those telescopes as big. Um, the reason that's not going to happen as soon as the ground-based ones is just they're so expensive. So the two things on the table for space telescopes for exoplanets are Louvoir, which might be 15 meters, might be 8 meters. It's still just a concept, just with renderings. Um, we're still studying even what size it should be in 2020, which does not mean that we're applying for funding next year. So, um, but you can look forward sometime in the next decade to a probably $10 billion proposal, maybe a $20 billion proposal, to build something like Louvoir. Um, the other one in the running is HabEx, a four meter telescope. So kind of small telescope with this really weird star shade that lets it uh, collect planet light and exclude starlight uh, with, with current technology, we think. Um, also a multi-billion dollar mission. So the technology is going to be there someday. It's hard. Every, every photon you want from that planet is hard. What do we get? What do we expect? Let's look. The thing people really want, I think people would be disappointed if we spent all this money pointing telescopes at stars, and then we come back and we tell you know, your kids and your grandkids, hey kids, let's all learn about this dead rock. <laughs> I found a, we, 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 we went to HR799 and there's a gas giant orbiting it, and it's really hot, and it's made out of methane. Isn't that cool? And the kids will say, kind of, some kids will be really excited, but it's not. It's kind of not what we really want to talk about when we're talking about exoplanets. Someday, we'd like to point a telescope at an exoplanet and say, there's life there. And that's what we mean by biosignatures. So in addition to getting light from a planet, we want to get light and then break it up into its constituent spectrum and say, what kind of light is this star bouncing off of this planet? So this is a plot from a, a, a kind of foundational paper in this field. Um, this, is, this is what we know on Earth. Light bouncing off of snow is white. Light bouncing off of sand is yellow. Light bouncing off of trees is green. If you looked at a distant planet and you saw its color, and you saw all the different parts that make up its color, you might be able to tell what the planet surface was covered with. Maybe you could see it change from season to season. Maybe you would see a planet that was red in the autumn and green in the, in the spring. I call it Ohio. Um, <laughs> and then white in between, That's something like that. You'd have to do it by looking at colors, which means you need a spot of light and you also need a bunch of spectroscopy. Um, the Earth's atmosphere has something even more interesting, which is when the Earth was formed, it probably had a lot of water, carbon dioxide, methane in the atmosphere, but now it's got oxygen. It wouldn't have oxygen if it were a dead, hot rock. In fact, there are very few ways to imagine anything other than life populating an oxygen atmosphere. So. Those are spectra of Earth's atmospheres at different times. If we looked at a distant planet, got that spectrum, and saw that little hint of oxygen, or ozone, that'd be big. That'd be something that would be in every, that would become part of just the foundational knowledge of humankind, right? It'd be the same as knowing that, that Mars is red and Pluto is cold, would be knowing that HR 8799C has oxygen. That would, be, that would be such a cool thing. And that's why it's worth spending all this money on. Um, let me skip ahead. There are some ways we might be able to make maps of exoplanets. If you had a telescope like Louvoir and you pointed it at Earth for like five years, you'd need to use a lot of Louvoir time pointed at a planet like Earth, you'd be able to tell that Earth has a yellow spot on one side and a dark spot on the other side. You know what that is? It's the, this, that's the Sahara and the Pacific. That's the kind of map we'd be able to have for an exoplanet with Louvoir. And so let me, let me conclude there. This is a famous image, which maybe a lot of you have seen before. So rec people recognize it? Where's my amateur astronomers? This is the pale blue dot image. This is the, um, the Voyager probe pointing back at Earth from, from the distance of Jupiter. And there's just this one little blue speck really just a pixel in their camera, not resolved, no continents, no oceans, no Sahara, um, seen from that far away. So that's what we'd like to have for something around another star. We'd like to have a little blue dot, and we'll have it. 
Um, it's not easy to do it from the ground. We're spending, I said, billions of dollars on glass and steel and software to control these things, fancy lasers, fancy lenses, fancy optics, um, subtracting out the atmosphere and getting all that planet light onto a detector that can tell us something. Um, everything at this scale is difficult and expensive. It's not going to get easier anytime soon. Um, but it seems to be worth doing. And so, yeah, I think in our lifetimes, we're not going to have DinoCam. Not going to be able to tell you what's going on up there, but we may have those little pale blue dots, a couple of pixels of a spectrum, probably have a bunch of hot dead rocks. That's what we can promise. You know, we can promise to look for what's out there, but we don't know what's out there. And so, with luck, maybe we'll have some biosignatures uh, telling us that these planets are really, really things to look at. And then it will definitely feel like it was worth it, um, despite all the difficulties. I'll stop there. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.